Okay. Greetings, uh, greetings, gang. Uh, this is uh, class number eight of uh, Cowell 126, the uh, eight cases that changed America. Uh, the in the last in the last discussion that we were having, which was uh, on Tuesday, the 24th of April, uh, we discussed the Watergate burglary, and uh, we uh, we got it all the way down to the point where there was a a resolution of impeachment that had been passed by the House Judiciary Committee uh, uh, on the July 28th of 1974, uh, which generated the resignation of Richard Nixon. Now, uh, that's, that is uh, one of the major events uh, that marked the, uh, the experience of the baby boom generation, uh, the so-called idealist generation. Uh, of the 21st century, uh, but there were there were a lot of events uh, that have taken place uh, during that period that's been referred to as the, as the 60s. We've touched upon a number of them already in this class. Uh, there's the assassination of Martin Luther King in April of 1968, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy in June of 68, massive riots at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, uh, and of course the Vietnam War. It went on throughout the whole period from 1964 to 1974. Uh, the Pentagon Papers case, uh, huge major national uh, events uh, that focused the attention of all of the news media uh, during that period uh, uh, and a number of others. But uh, none of these events uh, had uh, quite the kind of impact upon the uh, consciousness and uh, worldview of the members of the uh, 60s generation uh, that compared to really the assassination of President Kennedy uh, on November 22nd of 1963 in Dallas. Uh, it's one of, if not the most talked about, written about, uh, argued about uh, issues uh, in the lifetimes of uh, all of us so far. Uh, we, we had gotten uh, to the end of the discussion of the Watergate burglary uh, yesterday, and as you recall, the, the focus of the entire investigation, public hearings and everything about the Watergate burglary came down to a focus on a set of conversations that took place on June 23rd of 1972, uh, just several days after the break-in on the 17th of June. Uh, and in these discussions, the key discussions were a number of discussions that uh, took place that uh, John Dean, uh, who was the legal counsel for the president, uh, on the 23rd of June, telephoned to uh, Bob Haldeman, who was the chief of staff for Nixon, uh, early in the morning of June 23rd, and reported that there was a significant problem that they were having uh, because uh, L. Patrick Gray, the new acting uh, director of the FBI, uh, had contacted John Dean in his capacity as legal counsel for the president and it said that there was a very serious problem because uh, uh, Pat Gray was finding it impossible to keep the FBI under control is the way he put it in the in the conversation. Uh, what it really amounted to as it turns out is that Mark Felt who was the number two man in the FBI who was the deputy director under J. Edgar Hoover uh, who had died just two months previous, uh, was insisting upon carrying out an investigation uh, relating to a check that had been found in the inside jacket pocket of one of the Watergate burglars, uh, that, uh, uh, Bernard Barker. And this check, uh, Dean reported on the morning of June 23rd to Bob Haldeman, uh, had been tracked by the FBI, and when he kept referring to by the FBI, this was Mark Felt. This was the number two man in the FBI who kept insisting uh, against the pressure putting, being put on him by Patrick Gray, who was not an FBI guy, hadn't come up through the FBI. He'd been appointed to be the acting director of the FBI. And, uh, and Mark Felt obviously thought that he had the prerogative to be making investigatory decisions about this since he was the, the principal guy in the FBI that had been there for many years. 
And he was insisting uh, on the uh, day of June 22nd of 1972, he was insisting that he was going to be leaving on the 24th of June to fly down to Mexico City because this check that it was in the pocket of Bernard Barker when he was arrested in the Watergate Hotel on the 17th was actually written on a bank called the Banco Internacional uh, down in Mexico City uh, on a particular account of a lawyer, an attorney, uh, by the name of Manuel Ogario. And as I talked about at the, at the end of the, of the class uh, last Tuesday, there were a, there's a significant number of conversations that are, uh, have, were tape recorded uh, during June 23rd, taking place in the Oval Office, and reports of conversations pursuant to the testimony of others, including John Dean and Bob Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, who was the uh, domestic uh, <coughs> policy chief for Richard Nixon, all of which kept pointing to the same thing. Uh, that on, uh, on June 23rd, 1972, Nixon ordered Bob Haldeman uh, to contact Richard Helms and Vernon Walters at the Central Intelligence Agency and to tell them uh, a series of things that uh, had already been discussed by Richard Nixon, as it turns out, with Bob Haldeman as early as the night of the 20th, the first night that they got back into Washington uh, from Key Biscayne after the burglary had taken place. And already Nixon had, had referenced two or three different times uh, to go tell Ehrlichman, tell Ehrlichman that he's got to go see Vernon Walters and uh, tell him that if they don't, if the CIA does not intervene and stop this investigation by the FBI, and it was clear that the, the quote, this investigation that they were talking about was the investigation of this check and the fact that it had been drawn on the account of uh, this particular bank account down in Mexico City. Uh, in their uh, half a dozen quotations uh, that show that this is exactly what it is they were talking about. And, uh, and, and finally, Rich, Richard Nixon uh, said, said to Haldeman, uh, look it, tell, tell, uh, tell Ehrlichman, you guys go over and you tell Dick Helms and Vernon Walters that, that this Hunt guy is involved that uh, E. Howard Hunt, uh, who has now been arrested as part of the Watergate burglary, his quote was, this Hunt uh, is the key. He's the lever. Uh, Hunt will uncover a lot of things. You open that scab, and there's a hell of a lot of things that will come out. Tell them that we feel that it would be very detrimental to all of us if this thing goes any further. And as it turns out, as we talked about, uh, pursuant to those instructions from the president, uh, Haldeman and uh, Ehrlichman did go to meet with, or had uh, Vernon Walters and Dick Helms, the director of the CIA and the deputy director, come over to the office at 1.30 in the afternoon on June 23rd, and they told him uh, exactly that. And uh, uh, Helms threw a big fit, uh, and, uh, and, but finally they agreed to do this, and, uh, and Vernon Walters went to meet with Pat Gray of the FBI. And what Pat Gray relates in his testimony, uh, that he said, uh, uh, he said that right after the meeting with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, Dick Helms and I went downstairs and we talked for a moment. And Dick Helms said, you have to go and remind Mr. Gray of the agreement that the FBI has with the CIA that if the FBI investigation, any FBI investigation starts to, to touch upon assets of the agency and the agency asks the FBI to stop, that that investigation will be stopped. So he said that that's what Helms said to him. Uh, but when, uh, when uh, Vernon Walters, when Walters talked about what had happened and uh, what he said to Pat Gray, and Pat Gray verified that, and it was as follows. If you allow this investigation of this particular bank account in Mexico City to get pushed further south of the border, it could trespass on some very sensitive covert projects. And since you have these five men already under arrest, you ought to let it taper off at that. Now that, that's what he said to him. So the, the question that has been posed to a lot of people that have bothered to dig into this and see what the particulars were, what, it is that they, what is it they were talking about? If you push it farther south of the border in Mexico from Mexico City and you pursue this particular account, what is it you're going to run into? And in the last 
few moments of the class on Tuesday, I related to you uh, in a cursory fashion what it was that that was all about. Because it turns out that that particular account, the account of the attorney, Manuel, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what's, what did I say, uh, what's it said? Anyway, uh, Ogario, uh, that, that, that Manuel Ogario's account in the Banco Internacional was the exact account through which monies had been funneled and laundered back in 1960 to fund a, an extremely covert political assassination training base that had been set up uh, on the, in Oaxaca, Mexico, on the ranch of a fellow by the name of uh, Clint Murchison, Jr. Uh, and uh, and uh, as I, I told you, I said that this becomes extraordinarily important uh, in the uh, assassination of President Kennedy. And now, what I want to do today, given the importance of this, is I want to, uh, I, I know a, a lot of you at the very end of the, of the session uh, last Tuesday were looking a bit like you had taken a drink out of a fire hose uh, as I sort of poured it on you at the end as to what the, the implications of all of this really were. And so what I wanted to do today is take the time to step back and, and go through this uh, carefully with you so that you can understand what it is that I learned back in May of 1973 uh, when I was at F. Lee Bailey's office and uh, we were uh, representing James McCord uh, in the Watergate burglary. Uh, and it wasn't because James McCord told us uh, all of the stuff. He told us a lot about the burglary and some of the kind of things that they were looking for. The really important source of this information was another client of F. Lee Bailey's, who turns out to be Santos Traficante, who was the Don of the Mafia uh, in Havana, Cuba. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to start at the beginning, and I want to take it slowly so that you'll remember this, because this is some of uh, the most important information that you're probably ever going to be learning uh, in your life, not to overstate the importance of this course. Uh, but uh, but the, the, there's, there's a peculiar thing. You, you guys didn't experience it because you weren't here yet. Uh, but it, it, at that particular point, uh, after, the, after the resignation of Richard Nixon and the, the, uh, the select committee on Watergate closed down because it was no longer necessary to pursue the thing, they felt. They had, quote, figured it out. They had figured out that the, uh, President Nixon had given a direct order on June 23rd, 1972, to his chief of staff and domestic policy advisor to go to the CIA and get them to obstruct justice. And the first article of impeachment that was returned by the Judiciary Committee was for the president having committed the crime the federal crime of obstructing justice, and that that was sufficient unto itself to result in his, his impeachment and conviction. Uh, but when the, when the Senate Watergate Committee closed down, a very mysterious thing happened. The, for some reason, the uh, uh, this United States Senate decided that they were going to appoint a select committee to look into potential abuses on behalf, on the part of the American Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, the, Senate, the Senate committee was chaired by Senator Frank Church from Idaho and has ended up being called in history the Church Committee. And so that confuses a lot of people because they say, what are they investigating the church for? But, but it's, it's called the Church Committee and it was chaired by Senator Frank Church from, uh, from Idaho. And there was a House Committee, a correlative committee, uh, that was chaired by Otis Pike the Pike Committee. So there were two committees investigating, uh, all of a sudden, the abuses by the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, all of this is, is derivative of the fact that the particular thing that was being said by the president as the basis for getting the CIA to stop the FBI investigation was this thing about there being some kind of covert operation that was going on down in Mexico uh, that would have been revealed if, in fact, the, the investigation had continued about this account down in Banco Internacional. And so the, uh, the uh, senators in Washington, D.C., 
discovering that all of a sudden there was something that they had not been informed about. Uh, took great umbrage at this because you're supposed to be in on the know if you're a senator in Washington, D.C. And so they decided that having been offended uh, by the Central Intelligence Agency and Richard Nixon uh, and their entire staff, that they were going to look into this. And so they began holding these hearings, uh, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Abuse. Now, a, a, another peculiar quality of this is, is that all of a sudden, they're spun off from the uh, church committee hearings, uh, the establishment of a special select committee to reinvestigate the assassination of President Kennedy. And most of the people in the country were just kind of merrily going along, saying, well, I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, they didn't have the slightest idea why they were doing that. Okay? But, but uh, what, what I want to do is I want to uh, relate to you what it was that the House committee uh, to investigate the assassination of President Kennedy concluded and how it compares to what it is I knew already back in May. Their, their report came out in April of 1976. I knew about this in May of 1973. This is some three years prior to the committee uh, finding out all of this stuff. Now, so, so let's, let's take it a little bit slowly here, but I, I want to spend just a few minutes uh, preliminarily to point out that it's necessary in, in approaching something as, as profoundly important as this to, and as, as monumental as this is to take it kind of one step at a time. It's like my old friend Robert McIntosh who is the, uh, he's the president of the North American Mountain Climbing Association and I always used to say to him, I say, why do you guys do things like that for? Why do you climb these big mountains? And, stuff? and he said, oh, look, it's very easy. If you take it very carefully, one step at a time, and you drive your pinions in firmly enough, and know how to tie yourself off at each step and go to the next step, you can climb the biggest mountain. Uh, and that's what this is all about here. It's trying to take it step by step so you understand the context of it. The reason that people find it hard to believe what it is that happened to the president is because they don't understand the historical context of it all that it seems to have happened just kind of out of the blue. It didn't make any sense to people. And so therefore, it was very easy to pass off the complete mythology that, in fact, the president had just been killed by this lone nut gunman uh, by, by the name of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. So I want to I just spend a few minutes setting the context of this. Uh, and, and I want to, so you want to get back to the beginning of when all of this started. And so you, one can throw out any number of spots where you might want to carve into the thing to start talking about it at its beginning. But I want to very briefly point out that there has been, since the very founding of our country, a, uh, of our democratic federal republic, there has always been a certain distinct element within the governing circles of, of the, our American leaders who have never agreed with the most fundamental principles of our Constitution. They have never agreed with the natural law concept that people are all created equal. They have never agreed that people ought to be allowed to participate directly in the decision making about our government policies. They've always believed that they were part of an elite that were specially privileged that in fact had the right to make not only political decisions, but all the economic decisions for the nation. Uh, and they have been there since the very beginning. Uh, they were represented at the beginning uh, by, for exam example, uh, Alexander Hamilton. You had Thomas Jefferson and a lot of the Jeffersonians that were into kind of more egalitarian beliefs, natural law beliefs, etc. Uh, but you had Alexander Hamilton, who was the attorney that represented the major banking interests in the, in, the, in the new country. And they were constantly trying to get established a major central bank. They wanted to have a set uh, uh, of currency uh, that could be controlled by the central bank, that could be uh, created and printed by the central bank and issued as, as promissory notes, etc. So this, this dynamic went on. Uh, throughout the early founding of the country. And it, uh, it, it continued uh, throughout that entire first century uh, of, the, of our American government. 
And what uh, it, it came to, it, it, following, following the, uh, the American Civil War uh, later, there, it, it came to a, a, a crunch. At the end of the Civil War, there began a huge impetus on the part of members of this kind of elite to establish a major kind of industrial elite, banking industrial elite in the country. Uh, it's, it's become known uh, by shorthand as the era of the robber barons. Uh, where you had these major wealthy people that owned uh, uh, oil companies, railroad companies, steel mills. Uh, they, they owned mining corporations that owned gold and silver. And the, the, there was this, this elite that uh, had risen all the way to the top. And uh, in, in the periods of the 1880s, uh, the, the natural law advocates in the country who were Jeffersonians, who had been favoring the fundamental principles of our, of our country, basically gathered themselves together. And I just point it out to you so that you can do your own research on this if you're interested. They established a thing called the Chautauqua Movement. And the Chautauqua Movement became a profound and important movement on the part of these, this progressive community. Uh, it, was, it was created originally uh, as, a, as a, a part of the uh, United Methodist Board of Homeland Ministries created it as a, as a project up in northern New York at Chautauqua at their summer retreat. They established it to train people who were going to be uh, Sunday school teachers in Methodist churches. And that they were teaching these people, they would uh, provide free training for them in the summer at their summer resort up in, uh, up in northern New York. Uh, anybody who in the country that was going to be a, a uh, Sunday school teacher could bring their whole family to this place at Chautauqua, New York, and spend the summer there and be trained. And what they were training them to understand is how fundamentally antithetical to the basic values of Judeo-Christian social ethics, the conduct of this kind of ruling elite, these robber barons, really was. They really were. And so they spent from 1884 to 1888 training these people that were in the, that were the, uh, the future teachers of their Sunday schools, and they got so frustrated saying, this isn't going fast enough. And so what they did is they opened their doors to every single high school social studies teacher in the country, that they could come for free to Chautauqua, New York, with their families and spend the summer there. And in the summer of 1888, uh, there was this overwhelming response to this. And thousands of high school social studies teachers who were totally frustrated at these robber barons conduct came to Chautauqua, New York. They overwhelmed the facilities. Uh, they, they didn't have enough food for them. They didn't have enough places for them to stay. They had to set up tents. They were sleeping outdoors. They were getting food to the farmers from the whole area. Were bringing this, was, this was the original Woodstock uh, of the progressive era uh, of, the, of the 20th century. Uh, and and this, this, whole, this whole operation uh, started taking place. And so the following summer, what they did is they set up regional Chautauquas in a dozen places around the country. And each and every one of them was overwhelmed by high school social studies teachers coming with their families to learn about all this stuff. And so that uh, by, by the summer of 1919, there were over 3,600 Chautauqua sessions that were held in the United States that summer. Uh, so there was a huge push uh, coming from the progressive community to try to train the teachers and instructors around the country to talk to the younger people in the generation to come to understand how profoundly uh, in, in, uh, inconsistent with the values of the country, the values of Judeo-Christian social ethics, the conduct of these robber barons really, uh, really was. And so that, that was a, a major event that was going on uh, when when in, in, before and after World War I occurred. And the, the problem is, is that in 1917, in October of 1917, when the Bolsheviks in, in Russia overthrew the Tsar and forced Russia to withdraw from World War I, uh, the Bolsheviks set up a completely alternative line of attack on the robber barons. They attacked them as being rotten capitalists. Right? and that they attacked the very core of capitalism as being fundamentally dialectically opposed to the rights of the people. But there was nothing spiritual really about it. In fact, it was kind of self-consciously atheistic. 
and totally mechanical. It was based upon a concept of materially grounded dialectical confrontation between a thesis and an antithesis. But what had been going on since 1888 all the way up to 1917 in the Chautauqua movement, this was a spiritually uh, engined operation attempting to criticize the robber barons uh, on the basis of spiritual values and ethical values. But the bottom line is, is that that was a major period of history, the big progressive era. You would be very well rewarded to take a look at that because that Chautauqua movement and that progressive movement of the 1880s and early 1900s actually generated uh, some of the most important movements. It was the origins of the women's suffrage movement, uh, it, which generated by 1919 the, the right to women to vote. It generated the anti-child labor laws, uh, protecting children against being forced into involuntary labor. It, uh, it, it began the, real, the post-Civil War civil rights movement. It began the American labor movement. American labor unions were generated by the Chautauqua movement. That's how they created them. It began the original environmental movement. Uh, all, a lot of the major progressive movements were originated out of that Chautauqua uh, movement. Uh, but, the, but the robber barons uh, struggled and fought back, uh, and uh, by, by the end of World War uh, I, when you had the, this, in 1917, the Bolsheviks took over and the Soviet Union withdrew Russia, uh, what happened is a, a number of these robber barons uh, got themselves together and they got the federal government to authorize the creation of a foreign military expeditionary force which people don't know much about, but it was actually fielded and sent to Russia. An American military force was sent into Russia to try to recruit the, quote, white Russians that were in opposition to the red Russians uh, to actually try to stamp out the Bolshevik movement. So the, the, these, these elite corps in the United States actually participated in promoting and fostering that particular effort. Uh, and... and uh, so this, this uh, series of events was going on at the, at the end of World War I. And I should point out to you something very important here. Between 1924, uh, after, the world, after World War I, between 1924 and 1934, uh, a number of these elite organized themselves in, in a particular place. It was a major investment house in, in, uh, in New York. It was called Brown Brothers. And they, they uh, joined forces uh, with, a, with the Harrimans, and they formed a thing called the Brown Brothers Harriman Investment Corporation. And the uh, executive, the CEO of that particular operation, uh, was a man by the name of George Herbert Walker. And uh, George Herbert Walker, uh, in, starting in 1924, decided that what he would do is step aside and have his son-in-law, Prescott Bush, uh, would become the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman. And uh, George Herbert Walker went out and, and set up a, a bank affiliated with the Dutch bank in which they began to take contributions into the bank, investments into the bank, which were being used to finance the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany. And they became the principal source of financing of Adolf Hitler in the Nazi movement in Germany to create a bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe. Uh, and at the same time, in the post-World War I era, uh, Winston Churchill had been made the Secretary for Colonial Affairs of England, and he created a big commission, a 22-person commission, that basically set up all kinds of uh, arbitrary nation-state boundaries all through the Middle East, created Libya and Egypt and Iran and all of the boundaries of those countries, uh, basically in disregard of thousands of years of history in the tribal history of there. They just superimposed these boundaries in there. So this was a, it was, it was a, a, a very major era of the uh, assertion of colonial power that was going on here. And these uh, robber barons in the United States uh, had, had come to power and they were reaching out privately through Brown Brothers Harriman and through this banking system that George Herbert Walker was involved in, in helping to finance Hitler coming to power. And so that these, these people, now remember, in, in, before World War II, I guess you don't remember, 
uh, but you, you, you might recall from your readings uh, that prior to World War II, the Germans uh, under Hitler, when he became chancellor in 1934, they ended up invading uh, Poland in 1939. They invaded France. They invaded the Sudetenland. They, the, the German uh, Nazi army was marching in the streets of Paris, France, under the Champs-Élysées, having taken over France. They were firebombing, carpet bombing England. The United States wasn't intervening at all. And the reason for it is because this element inside the United States ruling circles supported Adolf Hitler. And they didn't want him stopped. And because of that, Franklin Roosevelt was having a terribly difficult time. Uh, actually, Roosevelt ends up with, with, with the 1929 major stock crash in the United States. Hoover gets booted out. Franklin Roosevelt comes in. Franklin Roosevelt uh, comes in. And uh, when, when he wins his second term in office, uh, uh, he comes in 1932. And by 1934, here's another thing, you know, that this group, this elite group of people, people involved in Brown Brothers Harriman, the DuPonts, and others, organized a military coup against Franklin Roosevelt. They actually attempted to recruit the commandant of the United States Marine Corps who had led the foreign military expeditionary force down into South America to overthrow the democratic government in Nicaragua on behalf of these same people because they, they actually, Brown Brothers Harriman, actually represented the United Fruit Corporation. And the United Fruit Corporation, the lawyers for Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, Cr Sullivan and Cromwell, two of the major lawyers in there were a fellow by the name of Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles that these guys were all partners in doing this kind of operation. And what happened is in World War II, when, World War II, when Franklin Roosevelt finally uh, got the United States to enter the war, uh, that, that we, go, we go all through World War II. I'm, I'm setting this up as quickly as I can because it's important for you to understand that there, there was this element within the leadership circles of the American uh, society down through history. And they had been very, very active all through the late 1880s and early 1900s. And there were very specific groups of people uh, in this period from 1924 to 1934 leading up to World War II who were actively supportive of, uh, of uh, the idea of fascism and the, the idea of having the central government like in Germany you know, tax everyone and organize everyone and take the tax monies and subsidize private capitalist corporations. That's what, that's what national capitalism is. That's what fascism was all about. And the people, a lot of the ruling circles in the United States favored that, as opposed to Bolshevism, who are attempting to take over private enterprises. National okay. Socialism. National Socialism. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what it is. It's national capitalism is what that is, is this government finance and subsidized private capitalism. Okay? So it's not to, not to have to become ideological about it, and uh, one certainly doesn't have to support, and I certainly don't, uh, the policies in the Soviet Union. But what, what this means is that you need to, you need to understand that uh, when World War II broke out and we end up coming to the end of World War II, Okay, remember what I told you in, uh, in February of 1943 when the 5th German army was crushed in front of the gates of Stalingrad. The, the Japanese Navy had already been destroyed at the Battle of Midway in June of, 1940, of 1942. And so by February of 1943, everybody started to realize that the, that the Allied nations were going to win the war. And what started happening then, there started becoming this whole shuffling around where this elite group inside the United States said, look it, okay, we're going to win the war. And what we've got to do is turn our attention to Russia. That Russia, even though they're allied with us in World War II, they're going to be our adversaries when the, when the war is over here. And so what they did is they began to try to organize themselves to establish a, a policy on the part of the federal government to support uh, the opposition of the Soviet Union. And what they did is they reached out in the, in the final months of, the starts in 1943. In 1943, let's, let's start right there, okay? In, in 1943, we have, a, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, Truman, 
who is, uh, who is, is still a vice president. Roosevelt is president of the United States, okay? And it's, it's, coming to, it's coming to the end of Roosevelt's term. He can still run again. But Thomas Dewey, Thomas Dewey was preparing to, to, to run for office. And he knew he was going to be running for president. He was the governor of New York. And what he did is he sent, in 1943, he sent uh, a member of his former staff of the district attorney of New York, uh, a young fellow by the name of Murray Gerfine who I'm sure you recognize immediately as being the federal judge in the Pentagon Papers case, who had been appointed by Richard Nixon just uh, weeks before he sat as the judge in the Pentagon Papers case. Thomas Dewey, back in 1943, sends, sends uh, Murray Gerfine to Great Meadows Prison up in Comstock, New York, and enters into an agreement there with, with uh, Lucky Luciano, a major mobster from New York City, that he will be released from prison and he will agree to do three things. He will agree to go back to Italy, to Sicily, and he will get the mafia in Italy and Sicily to be of assistance to the Allied forces when they invade into Italy in, in the, to, to end the war. And secondly, they agree to infiltrate, the, the mob, the mafia, will agree to infiltrate the American Teamsters Union and the American Longshoremen's Association, the unions, so that they can keep communists out of the unions at the end of the war. And thirdly, they end up striking a deal later, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, with Lucky Luciano. Bottom line is, the, the war starts winding down to an end, and what happens is, I, I mentioned uh, Reinhard Galen, who was the Third Reich's uh, anti-Soviet uh, intelligence chief turns himself in. He 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 microfiches uh, a whole set of the files of their assets against the Soviet Union, and he turns himself in to the American forces, and he says that look, I will in fact run the anti-Soviet intelligence for the NATO nations now that the war is over, uh, if you will let me off the Nuremberg War Crime Tribunal list and a hundred of my men. And we'll run the anti-Soviet intelligence for the NATO, for the for the Allied nations. Now that the war is over, and the United States uh, carries on a negotiation with him uh, at Fort Hunt, uh, outside of Washington D.C., for six long weeks, uh, and they end up agreeing to do that. And they put him in charge of the new intelligence uh, uh, agency for West Germany. And Reinhard Galen the Waffen-SS Nazi commander of anti-Soviet intelligence serves as the primary source of intelligence against the Soviet Union for the Allied nations for the next 26 years, functioning out of West Germany. Okay? And what, what happens then is they set up this, uh, they set up this uh, academy, I've mentioned to you before, up in Omer Abergau, up in the Bavarian mountains, and they begin to train a special anti-communist special warfare training academy group. Now, th those are things that, that uh, become very, very important because there, there began to develop an ethos uh, within the American uh, defense establishment, an intelligence establishment, right at the end of the war that was basically being supported by Third Reich Nazi Germans that had been actually not only brought in to be the intelligence chiefs against the Soviet Union, but that they brought them in down to Argentina and Venezuela and Brazil, and they, they helped them escape from Germany, took them off the Nuremberg War Crime Tribunal list, and they, they set themselves up being advisors to the basic governments down in South America. Now, all of this is, is established by very clear historical documentation now uh, but it's not something that many people know about or think about. Uh, and so, so what happened is we had a reaffirmation at the end of World War II of the same kind of anti-Bolshevik, anti-communist, anti-socialist, pro-capitalist kind of Nazi fascist elements uh, inside our, our American government that were in coordination with these types of forces. And they pushed very hard at the end of World War II to establish the National Security Act of 1947. 
And the National Security Act of 1947 created the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency. Uh, they set up a, a special National Security Council in the White House. Uh, and they, uh, they established a thing called the 5412 Committee. The 5412 Committee uh, is based upon Section 5412 of the National Security Act of 1947, which they interpreted as authorizing them to engage in covert operations to attempt to promote and foster the national security interests of the United States. Uh, uh, at, the, at the end of the war, at the end of the, of the war, uh, Eisenhower, as you know, Eisenhower was elected in 1952. His vice president was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, for eight years, between 1952 and 1960, as the vice president of the United States, chaired the 5412 committee. And in that capacity, he oversaw the, the covert operations that were undertaken by the Central Intelligence Agency to attempt to neutralize uh, the forces of socialism in Europe. And very importantly, they were uh, funded with a deep and dark black operations budget, which was never cleared through Congress, never authorized by Congress, never supervised by Congress to conduct this covert warfare around the world. Uh, and this is the, that Richard Nixon had become, over this eight-year period, kind of the secret domo uh, of this world. He ran the 5412 committee. He's the one that authorized the covert operations. They're the ones that accessed the kind of covert operations money. They funded former Nazis all throughout Europe. To, uh, whose names had been changed and they ran for public office. Their campaigns were financed through this secret fund. Uh, they opposed the partisans in France and in Poland and in, uh, in Austria and other places. The very people who had opposed the Nazis and had fought the Nazis were suppressed by the United States intelligence community. Uh, and covert operations were undertaken to neutralize them, to disrupt them, and, they were, and the fascist forces were actually positively funded by the American Central Intelligence Agency. Now, this, this sets the stage for Richard Nixon uh, coming to uh, power, and in uh, January of 1959, now this is a year before the 1960 elections, where, where John Kennedy is going to be running for the presidency, uh, you have the, uh, at the end of World War II, one of the additional things, the point I left for a later discussion here, what other thing did they get Lucky Luciano in the Mafia to agree to do besides infiltrate the, the Longshoremen and the Teamsters Union and to also ag agree to be scouts and assist the uh, landing forces in, in Sicily, at Salerno, and in Normandy. It's, they, they, they served as scouts for the American Allied landing forces. That the third thing that they got them to do was they, there was a secret program set up at the end of World War II pursuant to which uh, Jack Singlaub, General Jack Singlaub, was assigned to be the first CIA case officer to the Golden Triangle in uh, Southeast Asia. And they oversaw the smuggling of, of heroin, uh, actually uh, opium, out of the Golden Triangle and in collusion with the Corsican Mafia in France and Italy, they, they set up a heroin production operation that was actually smuggling heroin from the, from the Golden Triangle of Southeast Asia through Cuba. And uh, Virgilio Batista, who was the fascist ruler in Cuba, a totalitarian military dictatorship, he became business partners with Santos Traficanti who was the Don of the Mafia in Havana. And they put together a, a major heroin smuggling operation out of Southeast Asia, some of the profits for which were used to finance the Kuomintang, which is the nationalist Chinese of Chiang Kai-shek, who was attempting to oppose the rise of Mao Zedong to power in China. And this, the primary source of funding for Mao Zedong came through this heroin smuggling that was being coordinated by Santos Traficante and, uh, and uh, Batista in Cuba. The American Central Intelligence Agency had a company set up in Havana that was called the Sea Supply Corporation, 
S period, E period, A period, standing for Southeast Asia Supply, uh, headed by a full-time CIA officer by the name of Paul Halliwell. Paul Halliwell ran this operation, taking some of the profits from the heroin sales that were being supervised by Santos Traficante in Batista, and purchased weapons and explosives and stuff and had them smuggled into China uh, through Formosa to the nationalist Chinese. Uh, so, so Cuba had become a special place uh, in this covert operation that was going on at the end of World War II. It became the major conduit of heroin coming into the United States, being sold by the mafia in the black ghetto areas uh, to, to provide financing, covert financing for the nationalist Chinese in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, so, so at the time, uh, therefore, Richard Nixon was a very prominent person in the 5412 committee, chairing the 5412 committee in the National Security Council. So he had contact with a number of these mafia characters. Uh, and what happened is in, on January 1st of 1959, the, the, uh, the totalitarian government of Batista was overthrown in Cuba by a revolution led by Fidel Castro, uh, a young a lawyer in, uh, in Cuba, and uh, his brother, Raul Castro, and uh, Che Guevara, and a number of other five other major revolutionary leaders uh, overthrew the, the government there. They closed down the heroin trafficking, they closed down the gambling casinos, they closed down the major houses of prostitution, and Santos Traficante, the Don of the Mafia in Havana, fled from Cuba along with a lot of the major fascist allies of Batista. And they fled and came up to Florida, into Miami and Tampa. And, uh, and, that, and that's why Nixon was regularly going down to B Key Biscayne, down in Miami. One of his closest associates was a fellow by the name of B.B. Rebozo, who was a major mafia uh, assistant down there. Uh, very close to, uh, to uh, the uh, Santos Traficante, uh, and, and also to Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky, another major mafia figure, set up a thing called the National Bank of Miami, uh, in Miami, uh, which was a mob bank down there. And, uh, and in fact, it was B.B. Rebozo that made the major recommendation to Richard Nixon, later as president, to appoint the chief federal judge down in Miami. Uh, a man by the name of uh, James Lawrence King, who was in fact a member of the board of directors of the Miami National Bank. So this, this is the situation that you've got in, in January of 1959. So when, when the Cuban government is overthrown, the Batista government is overthrown, and the revolutionary government comes to power, Fidel Castro and Raul Castro approached the American government saying that they wanted to be friends with the American government even though they were overthrowing one of their fascist allies. Uh, they wanted to be friends. The, Richard Nixon choreographed the policy of saying that they, the only condition on which the United States would recognize the new government uh, of Fidel Castro is if they agreed to have no diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union or China. And Fidel Castro refused to do that, uh, very much as, uh, very much as uh, Ho Chi Minh refused to do that later in Vietnam. And the United States declared them to be an enemy because they had diplomatic relationships with China and with Russia. And so uh, Richard Nixon uh, uh, mounted a major covert operation to attempt to destabilize and overthrow the new revolutionary government uh, in Cuba. In, uh, uh, in the, the summer of uh, 1959, uh, Richard Nixon, in his capacity as the, uh, as the head of the 5412 committee, uh, initiated this covert operation against the government in, in Cuba uh, that was codenamed Operation 40. What he did is he recruited a whole bunch of mafia soldiers that had worked for Santos Traficante down in Havana that had been the, the muscle behind their houses of prostitution, their gambling casinos, and their heroin trafficking. And uh, in several dozen of these uh, gunzels were brought in to work for Operation 40, operating out of Miami. And what they would do is they were working for the Central Intelligence Agency uh, full-time, and they were mounting uh, paramilitary attacks against Cuba. They were going in and blowing up bridges. 
They were burning entire sugar fields. Uh, they were poisoning uh, foodstuffs that were loaded onto ships to be brought in or out of Cuba. Uh, uh, they were uh, attempting to carry out uh, 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 destruction of their economy in Cuba through Operation 40. In, in January of 1960, uh, January 9th of 1960, Richard Nixon announces that he's going to be running for the Republican nomination for president. Okay, uh, Eisenhower is finishing his, his second term. Uh, they had passed the, uh, the constitutional amendment in 1951, uh, limiting uh, presidents to two terms. So Eisenhower had to leave office. Nixon announces on January 9th he's going to be the candidate for the Republican Party. The only realistic competitor for him was Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, and as of January 29th of 1960, Nelson Rockefeller withdrew from the Illinois primary, uh, and everybody became, it became very obvious that Richard Nixon was going to be the nominee. He was functionally unopposed. Uh, and uh, on March 8th, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, and Richard Nixon, respectively, both win the New Hampshire primary uh, in 1960. Uh, on March 1917, March 17th, uh, was the actual date on which uh, Richard Nixon initiated uh, Operation 40 against the, the Cuban government uh, using Traficante soldiers. Uh, on April 5th, uh, JFK defeated Hubert Humphrey in the Wisconsin primary. Nixon was now completely unopposed. Uh, so, so what we saw happening now, they were setting up this operation where Kennedy was clearly going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party as of April. Uh, of 1960, and Richard Nixon was going to be the nominee for the Republican Party. This, is, this starts the chronology that I laid out to you rather rapidly at the end of the uh, session on Tuesday, uh, which is what I came to discover when I was in F. Lee Bailey's office in May of 1972, uh, or excuse me, 1973, in the midst of the Watergate burglary. Uh, we found this out because I was, we were trying to figure out what in the world uh, these burglars had gone into the Watergate Hotel to do because it was, it was so clear in 1972 that Richard Nixon was almost certain to win the, the presidential election. He was running against George McGovern. Uh, George McGovern uh, was a very uh, progressive guy, uh, very much opposed to the war in Vietnam. Uh, and it was very likely it was going to be kind of an isolated ideological campaign on the part of uh, McGovern, and uh, Nixon was going to uh, carry the election uh, substantially. So it didn't make any sense to people as to why uh, these people would go into the Watergate Hotel and burglarize the offices of Larry O'Brien. Now, uh, so I was asking the same question inside our office. I needed to know why this had happened. And so what we, what we discovered, uh, partly from James McCord, but most importantly, from Santos Traficante, one of, uh, another one of uh, F. Lee Bailey's uh, clients. And that was this, that in about June of 1960, when it had become perfectly clear that Richard Nixon was going to be the nominee of the Republican Party, and it was, uh, they thought it was probable that he was going to win the election because uh, John Kennedy was going to be the nominee for the uh, Democrats. They viewed it as basically his old man, Joe Kennedy, having bought the nomination for him. And they didn't think that he could withstand uh, Nixon's uh, you know, eight years of experience, contacts, you know, eight years of being the vice president. The Republicans had been in charge you know, for the entire eight years. And so Richard Nixon, uh, in June of 1960, uh, contacts Howard Hughes. As I mentioned to you, Howard Hughes was this man who had uh, been very, very prominent uh, for 20 years. Uh, he was a major inventor, major pilot. Uh, he owned a, a, a Hollywood uh, television or Hollywood uh, motion picture company. He'd been married to uh, two or three major uh, actresses. He, he went into seclusion following his, uh, his invention of the, what they call the Spruce Goose, this great big gigantic uh, prototype with the C-5A cargo plane. And people were making a lot of fun of him. Uh, he came out and personally piloted it down, down uh, in Long Beach uh, and flew it all over the, and landed. And so everybody was aghast at the fact that this really worked. He was so upset at the way he was being treated, he went into seclusion. 
Uh, and everybody figured he just went nuts and went away. Well, it turns out that what he did is he went undercover and he became a covert asset for the National Security Agency. He created a company called the Summa Corporation. He, uh, he invented uh, a thing called the Glomar Explorer that was capable of uh, retrieving a sunken submarine off the ocean floor in the deepest parts of the ocean. He, was, uh, he created a lot of other technological things uh, for the, uh, the National Security Agency. And a very important uh, project, which to this day remains extraordinarily uh, sensitive, uh, but uh, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, it was he, was, he was the chief operating officer in a thing called Operation uh, Desktop, which was an attempt on the part of the American National Security Agency to construct a anti-ballistic missile system uh, to install it on the continental shelf of the United States uh, off both coasts. Uh, and it was in complete and total uh, violation of the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty with the Soviet Union, but they thought they could get away with it covertly by creating a special type of submarines that could construct things underwater and that that was being run by, uh, by uh, Howard Hughes. And because of this, Richard Nixon, having chaired the 5412 committee for all these eight years, was, had close communications and contact with Howard Hughes. And so what he did is in June of 1960, having been assured that he was going to be the nominee for the Republican Party, highly confident he was going to win the national election, he contacted Howard Hughes via the uh, confidential uh, secure telephone line that they had and uh, asked Howard Hughes if Howard Hughes would, uh, would create an assassination team for Richard Nixon, uh, which would assassinate Fidel Castro and Raul Castro and the five other uh, revolution, heads of the new revolutionary government. Uh, and in that conversation, uh, Richard Nixon said, you cut off the head and the snake will die. And uh, Howard Hughes, in that conversation, in the first week of June, did not agree or disagree with uh, Nixon that he would do this. But what he did do after he hung up is he contacted one of his young lawyers, a fellow by the name of Robert Mayhew, and told Mayhew that the president, is how they were referring to him by now, uh, Nixon, wanted to have this assassination team put together. And Howard Hughes delegated to uh, Bob Mayhew responsibility for getting this done. Uh, Bob Mayhew then went, they were in Las Vegas, as I said, Howard Hughes lived above the, the big casino that he owned, a big gambling casino in Las Vegas. Uh, the, his lawyer, Bob Mayhew, went to meet with uh, Johnny Roselli, who was the Las Vegas representative at one of the big casinos that was owned by the mafia. And his principal was a fellow by the name of Sam Giancana. He was the, the don of the mafia in Chicago. And uh, so, so uh, the, the lawyer for Bob, May Bob Mayhew, the lawyer for Howard Hughes, met secretly with, with Johnny Roselli, said, look, uh, my principal, Howard Hughes, has been contacted by the president, uh, the w upcoming president, Richard Nixon. They want this assassination team put together to kill these guys. He says, and you guys, you guys in the mafia, have your own reasons for wanting to get rid of Castro uh, in Che Guevara and these people. You want to reestablish your gambling casinos, your houses of prostitution, and your heroin trafficking. Uh, and you want to be able to do this, and so uh, wh why don't you guys agree to do this? And so Johnny Roselli flies to Chicago, meets with, uh, with Sam Giancana toward the end of the first week of June, presents this proposition to Sam Giancana. Sam Giancana says, well, wait a second. Uh, this is, this, you're talking about assassinating the, the president of Cuba. The Don, the Don in our organization for Cuba is Santos Traficante. We can't do a thing like this without consulting with Santos. So what they do is they set up a set of meetings now in the, the, the middle of the second week to the end of the second week of June of 1960 at the Fontainebleau Hotel down in Miami Beach. And they go down and they have a series of three meetings. Uh, in the first two meetings, they discuss this proposition about whether they're going to be doing this. Uh, and the, they finally decide in principle that they will agree to do this. 
And so, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, Santos Traficante says, look, I don't want to get caught short here and have someone try to blame this on us. Uh, I want to make sure that Nixon has the, is the one who has authorized this to be done. And so what he does is he insists that some representative from Richard Nixon come to the third meeting and give them the green light on this proposition. And the guy that comes to the meeting, as I mentioned to you, but you probably didn't get it last time, is uh, he used the nom de guerre, uh, Mr. Ed. Uh, it was Sheffield Edwards, who was the chief of security for the Central Intelligence Agency at the time, uh, under Bill Harvey. Uh, and uh, and the, the, they were, this was done in 1960, in June. And so when he gives them the green light, then Santos Traficante agrees he's going to do this. And what Santos Traficante does is he recruits some of his former soldiers from the mafia down in Havana who are now working for the Central Intelligence Agency in Operation 40 under Richard Nixon. And he recruits them to become part of a, a highly secret uh, unit they called the S-Force. S is in Sam, the S-Force. There are 15 uh, anti-Castro Cubans uh, in this, that all of whom were working with the Central Intelligence Agency in Operation 40. Uh, these, these 15 men were spread out among five paramilitary bases that had been established in the southeastern section of the United States, one at No Name Key, one at Swan Island, one in the Everglades, uh, and two in Louisiana uh, at Lake Pontchartrain, one on the southern shore and one on the northern shore. And I, I, I repeat this because it's important for you to understand the details of this. Uh, and that, that what happened is, is there was a policy where a pri private planes would go and pick these guys up, these 15 guys, and they would fly them to uh, Fort Huachuca uh, in Arizona. And they would sign in, and then they would just disappear. And they were flown secretly from there down to Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, and they were housed at this ranch owned by Clint Murchison Jr., uh, the son of Clint Murchison, the owner of the, of the Dallas Texan football team, and the Santa Anita racetrack in uh, California. Uh, major contributors to the Republican Party, uh, people that were supportive of uh, John Edgar Hoover, who used to come uh, with his uh, friends uh, to Santa Anita to race there. And, and this, this ranch was the Triangular Fire Team training station. And these 15 uh, anti-Castro Cubans, uh, Rafael Chichi Quintero, Ricardo Chavez, Rolando Martinez, Virgilio Gonzalez, these guys, there are a whole bunch of them that we know who they are, that uh, they were trained there uh, by a man by the name of Carl Jenkins. And they were trained in hitting a moving target from three separate locations with high-powered rifles to assassinate uh, the people that they chose to. And this operation was uh, in, in full swing uh, by, by August and September uh, of 1960. When the election was held in November, however, uh, uh, there, there was still a, there was a plan afoot already. Nixon was so confident that he was going to win the election that he started planning uh, an invasion of Cuba which he had planned to undertake right after he got elected to his, to his first term as president in, in, uh, in November of 1960. He was going to do this in April of 1961. He was going to stage this invasion where he was going to have the uh, anti-Castro Cubans from Operation 40 go into the Bay of Pigs, set up a, a base, raise a, a flag, uh, and announce the fish is red, this code name, the code word they had, at which point Richard Nixon was going to recognize that government as the new free government of Cuba, and they were going to be United States Marines on board ships, Navy, U.S. naval ships off the shore of Cuba that were going to come ashore and, and take over the island and knock out uh, Fidel Castro. Okay, that was the plan of Richard Nixon. Uh, and uh, John F. Kennedy was briefed by Alan Dulles uh, in, uh, in September about the existence of Operation 40. He was not briefed about the plan to invade in the Bay of Pigs in April of, of 61. And he was not briefed about anything about the S-Force. But he knew about the, uh, uh, the Operation 40 
And so in their second debate uh, in October of 1960, <laughs> John Kennedy, in the debate, confronts Richard Nixon and says that you're soft on communism. You know, you, in fact, aren't doing anything about Cuba. Cuba is sitting here 90 miles off our shore where there's a totalitarian government, a communist government there, and you're not doing anything. <clears throat> and Richard Nixon was completely livid uh, because he is the one that created Operation 40. He's the one that was doing all this stuff. He, in fact, was even secretly planning to assassinate these guys. But uh, John Kennedy corners him in the secret debate and makes him look like uh, a weakling. And Nixon never, he was furious about this. Uh, uh, and it comes, it comes to the election, November 8th of 1960. John F. Kennedy wins by 0.16%. He wins the election by 112,000 votes uh, out of all the votes cast in the United States. And uh, uh, JFK uh, comes into the presidency in January of 1961, and he's for the first time briefed about the planned invasion at the Bay of Pigs. And as I mentioned briefly to you at the end of the class uh, on Tuesday, he refuses to provide the United States Marines. He says, look, if the CIA is correct and it's such an unpopular government, if, they, if the uh, Cubans go ashore and they raise the free flag of Cuba and announce that they've come ashore, uh, hopefully all the people will rise up and overthrow Castro, uh, and I'm not going to supply any kind of uh, uh, U.S. Marines for you. Uh, but they did, and he did allow private uh, air operation to be launched, as I told you before, out of Nicaragua. But unfortunately, they were, they were an hour late because they were in the wrong time zone. Uh, and, uh, and so th this, this sets the stage now uh, th that the, the, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion takes place. Uh, the aircrafts don't get there on time to give them air cover. They get massacred on the, on the beach. Uh, some 44 of them were, are arrested and taken as prisoner by Castro. John Kennedy comes forward and admits that this was a really dumb mistake. He was responsible for it. He apologizes to Khrushchev. He apologizes to the people of the United States. Uh, he says that he's going to break the Central Intelligence Agency into a thousand pieces because of what they have done. Uh, and, uh, but after promising Khrushchev that he was going to stop any further paramilitary activity against Cuba, uh, John Kennedy actually just simply changes the code name from Operation 40 to Operation Mongoose, and he sets up a huge base at the uh, University of Miami called JM Wave, out of which they operate, uh, and he, uh, he dismisses Alan Dulles, uh, as, the, uh, as the director uh, of the Central Intelligence Agency and uh, dismisses the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency and, uh, and uh, spends the remainder of 1960 and, six, and 1962 uh, having this covert operation going on against Cuba, attempting to overthrow them directly contrary to the promise that he made to Khrushchev. Okay. And then what happens is in, uh, in Octo on October 15th of 1962, this becomes crucial now because this is uh, the, the primary reason. Not because John Kennedy refused to provide air cover for the people at the Bay of Pigs. Because he went down after the Bay of Pigs, he went down into, into uh, Miami, actually. And in the, in the soccer stadium in Miami... Uh, John Kennedy got up in front of the entire assembled anti-Castro community in Miami and apologized for not having been more effective in the Bay of Pigs and promised that before the end of his second term, the free flag of Cuba would fly over the island of Cuba. And so he had neutralized uh, any of these arguments about him having not given adequate air cover. Uh, but what happened here is that because Khrushchev learned, it wasn't too hard to find out, that the United States was still covertly uh, sending uh, paramilitary operations into Cuba, uh, Castro, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Khrushchev decided that he was going to put missiles uh, into Cuba. Uh, and he starts secretly smuggling uh, missiles into Cuba. And on the morning uh, at 8.30 or 8.30 p.m. in the evening on October 15th of 1962, 
the Central Intelligence Agency notifies uh, McGeorge Bundy in the White House, National Security Advisor for President Kennedy, that they have photographs, that the U-2 has photographed. The U-2 is this big high-flying airplane that flies like, you know, 15 miles above the ground and has these magnificent cameras that take pictures. They were taking pictures showing that there were the nuclear missile sites that were being constructed uh, in, on the island of Cuba. Uh, they had uh, six different bases, four sites at San Cristobal and two at uh, San Guelo Grande, and they photographed them. Uh, the National Security Advisor tells the President, uh, John, John Kennedy, the following day on October 16th, uh, convenes uh, the members of the National Security Council uh, and five additional key advisors at 6.30 p.m. In the, in the evening. Uh, he sets them up as the XCOM, uh, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, uh, and uh, he decides on the 21st, uh, five days later, they come to a resolution they're going to blockade Cuba. They send U.S. Uh, naval vessels uh, to blockade Cuba, prohibiting any type of uh, weaponry to be brought to the island of Cuba, but they will allow food and in, uh, in provisions through. Uh, on October 22nd, the, the following day, uh, uh, Kennedy addresses the nation. Now, we were alive then. I was, in 1962, I guess I was like, uh, what, seven, 16 years old, 17 years old. We all saw it, uh, Kennedy coming on television announcing that the Russians had put missiles uh, into Cuba, that uh, he was announcing that any, uh, any launch of any missile from the island of Cuba against any nation in the, in the Western Hemisphere would be viewed as a direct act of war on the part of Russia against the United States, and that the United States would retaliate with a full-scale thermonuclear attack against uh, Russia. Uh, you can imagine that's a pretty chilling uh, set of news coming on. He, sends, he puts the United States up to DEFCOM 3, uh, a state of readiness. Uh, uh, on October, that was on October 22nd. On October 25th, uh, at 7.15 a.m., uh, the USS Bucharest, uh, the USSR Bucharest, uh, comes to the blockade, is determined to have no weapons on it, so they're allowed through. Uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, that afternoon uh, of October 25th, uh, the CIA reports that they're still uh, viewing the Soviets continuing to build the missile sites uh, on the island. Uh, Kennedy issues Security Action Memo 199, directing now for the first time the loading of nuclear weapons onto all U.S. aircraft uh, under the command and places them under the command of SAC, Europe. Uh, now, this is under the command of uh, General uh, Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay is the, uh, the chief of staff for the United States Air Force. Uh, this is the point at which Curtis LeMay starts advocating that uh, we, first he starts advocating that we carry out a, an airstrike against all of the uh, missile sites on, in Cuba. He said that uh, he would have responsibility for doing this. He advocated doing this. Uh, Kennedy said no, uh, we, we were going to wait to see if this blockade was going to work. Uh, the Soviet Union on the 26th uh, turns 14 ships around uh, and orders them back uh, to return, back to, back to the Soviet Union. Uh, at 10 p.m. on the 25th of October, uh, Kennedy raised uh, the debt to DEFCOM 2, the, the first time in American history that we've gone to DEFCOM 2. Uh, General Curtis LeMay uh, orders 23 nuclear-armed B-52 Stratocruisers to go to their fail-safe points around the border of the Soviet Union uh, to remain uh, within striking distance, to be sent into Russia to carry out a potential first strike against uh, the Russian mainland. Uh, uh, 180 uh, SAC bombers uh, go on to airborne alert. 145 uh, U.S. intercontinental ballistic missiles are armed. Their nuclear warheads are armed and they're put at the ready. Uh, there are 161 uh, U.S. Uh, fighter jet interceptors are put airborne uh, uh, and put on 15-minute alert to be sent uh, to, to, attack, to attack any, uh, any Russian uh, ships that are still uh, attempting to run the blockade. Uh, this, this becomes an extraordinary uh, day, October 26th. 
uh, this is this this becomes the the the, the strategic day here on October twenty between October twenty sixth and Saturday October twenty seventh a series of communications are going on between uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev on at six p.m. on Friday the twenty sixth of October he sends a message to uh, Kennedy uh, saying that look. Uh, you guys have, have got uh, these nuclear uh, missiles in Cuba, or excuse me, in Turkey and in, in Italy. Uh, we've, you, you say we've got these in, uh, in, uh, on the island of Cuba. How about we take ours out of Cuba if we had any, and you take yours out of Turkey and Italy? Uh, Kennedy sends back to them, no, that he's not accepting that. How about this? How about you agree to take all of your missiles uh, out of uh, Cuba uh, and we'll consider giving you a pledge that we will not undertake any more paramilitary actions against Cuba. Khrushchev comes back and says, you already said that. Uh, and he said, no, no, but I really mean it this time, Kennedy says. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so the, these messages are going back and forth. And, uh, and Khrushchev, Khrushchev then sends a message very clearly determined to be written personally by him uh, at 2 a.m., on Saturday morning, uh, October 27th, in which he says uh, he's considering this proposition uh, personally about uh, if he can get a good pledge from Kennedy not to invade Cuba, that would save face for them. Uh, but he still, wants, he still wants Kennedy to agree as a, a gesture of goodwill to voluntarily agree to take the, the uh, U.S. missiles out of Turkey and Italy. Uh, Kennedy is considering this when the following, the following morning, uh, on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time, Radio Moscow broadcasts a very aggressive speech on the part of Khrushchev, uh, saying that uh, the United States had to remove their missiles from Turkey and Italy. Uh, under no circumstances were they going to withdraw their missiles from Cuba. Uh, and it becomes a total hard line. And uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, th this, is, this becomes the critical point in time. Uh, at at uh, 10 a.m., the, uh, the XCOM, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the, uh, the National Security Council, they meet. They've determined that there's been a pushback on the part of the hard, uh, hardcore elements inside the military in the political party in Russia that they've overruled Khrushchev and they aren't going to allow Khrushchev to accept this deal of just having this agreement from Kennedy to withdraw uh, any military operations against Cuba. They're going to demand that the, that the missiles be taken out of Turkey and Italy. Uh, at 11.30 11, at 11 uh, a.m., uh, the, the, the USS Grozny is reported. This is the USSR uh, uh, craft now. This got bit, they've got real-time satellites on it now, NSA satellites, uh, and they're doing overflights of these ships that are all coming. They can see missiles under the tarps uh, on the USS Grozny and it's approaching the, the uh, barricade, uh, the blockade line. And uh, at this point, uh, 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 at this point, uh, uh, Curtis LeMay uh, insists that uh, if, this, if this ship tries to run that uh, blockade, that, uh, that he be authorized to send fighters in to, to sink it. Uh, and uh, in that if, if they do that, the Soviets have announced that they would view this as an act of war, and he suggests that, well, we've got our, uh, we have these uh, 23 nuclear-armed B-52s at fail-safe points around the Soviet Union. Uh, why don't we just send them in against the Soviet Union? If we're going to attack the USS Grozny, we cannot allow the Grozny to cross this line. Kennedy pushes back against him. Uh, uh, the, uh, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, uh, pushes back against him. Uh, but then at noontime, uh, a U-2 flight is sent over Cuba, uh, piloted by Major Rudolf Anderson, and he is shot down uh, by the Soviets on, uh, on the island of Cuba. They hit him with a SAM missile, S-75, to have a missile, and shoot him down and kill him. Uh, at uh, 3:41 p.m., uh, the United States Air Force, uh, United States Air Force Crusader, flying, taking reconnaissance pictures of the of uh, the island, is shot uh, with a missile. Uh, a th well, actually, a 37 millimeter cannon uh, over Cuba, and uh, JFK is uh, told by Curtis LeMay uh, that he needs to authorize a, a direct, immediate attack 
uh, on all of the missile sites on the, on the island. Uh, this, is a, this is an extraordinarily uh, delicate moment. Uh, at 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, the United States Navy dropped uh, signaling depth charges on a Soviet submarine that was off, just off the blockade. Uh, these, are not, uh, these are not deadly uh, uh, depth charges. They're signaling depth charges to start to get depth, depth gauges. But the Soviet submarine had been authorized, if its hull was penetrated by any one of these, to launch its nuclear torpedoes. Uh, against the U.S. ships at that time. They'd been authorized. It was the first time the Soviet Union had ever authorized one of their field commanders to, uh, to fire uh, without being given a direct command, a nuclear weapon. Uh, the U-2 uh, uh, U spy plane, uh, at that point, uh, at uh, 8.35 p.m. that evening, a United States U-2 spy plane accidentally moves into the territory over the Soviet Union. Uh, and goes 90 miles inside Soviet territory. The Soviets read this as an initial foray uh, to start taking photographs to support a, uh, a, a first strike nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. They've got uh, all, they've got all uh, 23 nuclear armed B-52s on radar at their fail-safe points. Uh, now the, the U-2 flight has entered uh, Soviet uh, airspace uh, and uh, at that point, they, they start arming and preparing their nuclear uh, missiles. Some 300 uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles are armed by the Soviet <coughs> Union and are being prepared for launch. Uh, uh, the Soviets uh, scramble MiG fighters to, uh, from Wrangell Island to intercept the, uh, the U-2, and the United States sends uh, 25 F-104 jet fighters uh, over the Bering Sea to shoot down the, the, the Russian MiGs. Uh, at that point, the USS Grozny crosses the U.S. blockade. And it, it, was, at that, it was at that point that uh, Curtis LeMay insisted that he be given authorization to go in to launch a first strike nuclear attack against the Soviet Union. Uh, Kennedy said no. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff went into session, and what they, what they did is they put in a proposal that LeMay modified his proposal, uh, and this is important, we were talking about the other day, he modifies his proposal to authorize him to launch an attack to destroy all of the, the missile sites on the island at that point. And it turns out that the commanders of the nuclear missile sites uh, at that point. They were all online and prepared to be fired. They were capable of being fired, and they had received direct orders from the Soviet Union that if any one of, if an attack were launched by the United States uh, against those missiles, that they were to launch all of those missiles against the United States, uh, which would have resulted in the United States launching a full-scale retaliatory attack against the Soviet Union and would have destroyed uh, virtually all of human civilization and would have resulted in uh, a major nuclear winter uh, throughout the northern hemisphere. Uh, so this is, this is where we were at uh, 8.30 in the evening at that point in time uh, on the night of the uh, 27th of uh, October. And it was at that point that Bobby Kennedy and Llewellyn Thompson Got the, uh, got the idea that what they would do is, is Kennedy uh, refused the order uh, of LeMay and he refused uh, the decision that was made by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to authorize the attack on the island at that point. Uh, and and uh, when, when uh, Kenny O'Donnell came in and told the president that the Joint Chiefs had voted to launch a, a full strike against the island and to destroy all the missiles. Uh, Kennedy said absolutely not, that this, he was not going to be the man to start this thing. Uh, he, he didn't know at that time that the commanders of the missiles on the island had been authorized uh, and directed to launch a full-scale nuclear attack against the United States in which probably 100 million people uh, would have been murdered uh, by that strike. Uh, and that would have resulted in a full-scale nuclear war. But Kennedy said, I will not be the man who starts this. 
uh, and he ordered them to stand down from DEFCON 2. Uh, and he, he immediately uh, opened up a back channel of communications to, uh, to uh, Khrushchev. Uh, he insisted that they, uh, that they stand down from this. He proposed to Khrushchev that not only would he agree to take the missiles out of Cuba, out of Turkey, and out of Italy, uh, but that they wanted to, he wanted to open negotiations with a, a uh, nuclear uh, test ban treaty. And he wanted to step back away from this abyss where that they had both looked into. Uh, he opened up communications to Castro to start trying to consider normalizing relationship with Castro. He reached out to, to uh, Khrushchev to start this negotiation on the uh, nuclear arms uh, treaty to, to disarm all the nuclear missiles. Uh, that he, he started taking a number of very dramatic steps uh, at that point. Uh, he immediately, uh, and we're going to run a, a few minutes over because we started 10 minutes late, but I want to I take that what, what happened is that Kennedy gave an immediate order that, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that these bases, these paramilitary bases that had been set up under Operation 40 and were continuing to run under Operation Mongoose, that all five of those paramilitary bases be shut down immediately and no more activity be authorized at those bases. We had come right to the very brink within literally seconds of a major thermonuclear holocaust on the planet uh, over this and he ordered them to shut down those bases immediately. Uh, and he opened the back channel to Castro. Uh, in November, uh, he, he issued those orders. Uh, in January of 1963, Frank Sturgis, who was a, the CIA officer in charge of the operations on No Name Key, launched a military attack, a paramilitary attack against the island of Cuba in complete defiance of the orders given to him by the president. Uh, Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy, Robert is the Attorney General and John Kennedy is the President, uh, immediately mobilized uh, some 40 U.S. Marshals, full military armed with automatic M M16 rifles, put them on six helicopter uh, attack gunships and sent them in to No Name Key and burnt out the camp and arrested all of them and charged them with a violation of the Neutrality Act of attacking a country with whom the United States was technically uh, in p at peace. Uh, they thought that was going to be an adequate warning to these people that they had to shut down those bases. But in March of 1963, E. Howard Hunt, uh, in charge, the CIA officer in charge of the camp at the Everglades, uh, started preparing a second paramilitary attack to be launched against Cuba. And Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy sent in a second series of helicopter gunships uh, burnt them out, arrested them, charged them with violation of the Neutrality Act. Uh, in April, uh, the series of letters started going back and forth and back and forth between Khrushchev and Kennedy, starting to put together the details of this nuclear uh, test ban treaty. Uh, on June 3rd, Walter Sheridan uh, contacts Bobby Kennedy and tells Bobby Kennedy that he has discovered that there is an S-force that was, had been created uh, of uh, 15 uh, paramilitary uh, anti-Castro Cubans that were uh, engaged in the process of attempting to assassinate Fidel Castro and that they were still operational. Uh, Bobby freaked out totally uh, about this, told President Kennedy about this. Orders were given to stand down that force. Uh, and on June 4th of, uh, of uh, 1963, uh, the following day, President Kennedy issues Executive Order 11110, uh, authorizing the, uh, the creation of a new form of currency in the United States uh, that was going to be supported by, the, by gold and silver, uh, which would have resulted in the shutting down or the atrophying of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, on uh, Saturday, June 8th, uh, the the uh, Dick Billings, who is the uh, Miami bureau chief for Time Life magazine under Henry Luce, is contacted and notified that there is going to be an operation going into Cuba, uh, which is allegedly going to be going into to uh, take into custody two Soviet colonels that were in charge of the the missile sites that want to turn themselves in. Turns out what that really is is a last-ditch effort on the part of the S-Force to go in to assassinate Fidel Castro 
in Raul Castro. He's on board uh, a big, uh, 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 what they call it, the uh, PKY, PKB, P PBY. PBY. He, he's, on, he's on a PBY, and they fly in with Rip Robertson, Rudy Enders, Virgilio Gonzalez, uh, Eugenio Martinez, and a guy by the name of John Martino. They fly in, and they land on the, uh, the sea outside of, uh, outside of uh, Cuba, off Cuba, and a yacht comes pulling up uh, under the ownership of a William D. Pauley, uh, a, a very wealthy uh, right-wing Republican uh, advisor, uh, and uh, the guy that owned the, in partnership with the Batista, owned the public transportation system on the island of Cuba. Uh, and he brings them, he has them go ashore from his, his yacht to try to carry out this assassination operation. And uh, on the night of June 11th of uh, 1963, uh, they're waiting offshore. They go back off to a reef offshore waiting for this team to come back from this assassination attempt. And they're drinking Jack Daniels and, uh, and uh, firing tracer bullets off into the night uh, and uh, getting uh, basically smashed on Jack Daniels. And uh, this guy, John Martino, who was a, a Santos Traficante mobster on board the thing, starts ranting about Kennedy and what an SOB he is and what a traitor he is for, for having ordered them to stop uh, this assassination attempt and for shutting down the military bases uh, and for trying to have this contact with Cuba. And uh, Martino is jumping up and down about this. And uh, William Pauley, William D. Pauley, turns to him and says, don't worry, John. We're going to kill that motherfucker. And this is, this is the assassination team that has been put together by Richard Nixon and Howard Hughes, originally created to kill Fidel Castro, that has now made the decision as of June 11th of 1963 that they're going to turn on the president and they're going to kill him. And uh, this is the group that does it. This is the group that flies to uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, they were going to kill him in, uh, in Miami. He was scheduled for a campaign trip into Miami in late October of 1963, but he uh, cancels it because they got uh, word that there were, it was too dangerous for him to go into Miami. He reschedules and is on his, he goes into Texas on November 22nd of 1963 uh, and is assassinated by the, by the S Force. And the, uh, the word goes out uh, almost immediately uh, after the assassination, uh, that uh, a, a fellow has, uh, someone has shot uh, Tippett, a uh, Dallas police officer, uh, Tippett, was shot by someone, and an all points bulletin goes out looking for this person, and they, uh, they stated that he is uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. This is the guy that's suspected of uh, killing this, uh, this Tippett. And, uh, and as soon as the word goes out, that there's an all-points bulletin out for this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald. Everybody who knows about the S-Force realizes that this, this is the S-Force that has done this because Lee Harvey Oswald is the guy that the S-Force was setting up to take the fall for killing Castro. And so as soon as they realize that there's just been a 180 done here and that they turned around and set up the same guy that was going to take, supposed to be designed to take the fall for killing Castro, and they've had him now be, be the guy that's being sought for this. Everybody knew that this is what was going on. And immediately, uh, a massive cover-up uh, starts to roll into place. Uh, and lies are, are, are flying fast and furious, uh, and the, uh, the American Central Intelligence Agency engages in a massive cover-up uh, of the assassination. Uh, the question that remains... Uh, and will have to, be, have to remain for at least another probably one year, uh, is what role did anybody higher up than just the S-Force members themselves uh, who higher up in the Central Intelligence Agency or any of the other agencies of the American government, if any, uh, how many of them knew about the assassination plan, how many of them uh, authorized it, and if so, why? And uh, that's a, uh, a matter that will have to remain for the completion of a set of investigations uh, that are going on at the present time. Uh, but that's so you'll know, okay? That's so you'll know, and you'll know why it is that it turns out that Richard Nixon 
when he discovered that uh, Larry O'Brien, who had been for years the Washington major lobbyist for Howard Hughes, when he was made the head of the Democratic National Committee, why it is that Richard Nixon gave the direct order to Jeb Stuart Magruder to send these people in to the Watergate. Uh, and that is why the 18 and a half minute gap uh, is in the tape uh, of one of the uh, discussions that went on on the 21st of, uh, of June of 1972 because it was in that 18 and a half minute period that uh, Richard Nixon explained that uh, they had to shut off the, this investigation because it could lead back to uh, this event that took place in Dallas and that he was terrified that he was going to get blamed for this uh, because it turns out that he's the one that had created the very team that had killed the president and his major political rival, uh, which eventually allowed him to be able to come into power as the new president. So there's the, uh, there's the story. So uh, uh, the, the, as I say, the case that I was involved in was the Watergate burglary case itself, but it's one of those kind of things that once you find out a thing like this, uh, is something that you, you cannot just let rest, and uh, it needs to be resolved. But uh, this, was, this was the most traumatic event that took place during the 60s, and it was the most traumatic event helping to form the consciousness of the members of the baby boom generation. So there's, uh, there's that. Okay.